Welcome to Facebook, Aeronautical Enthusiasts. I'm Jamie Beckett, and this is Ask an Ambassador. You know that because it's the second Tuesday of the month. It's 7 o'clock on the East Coast, and we got stuff to talk about. Working with me tonight is way over there in Southern California, Kay Sundrum, the most fabulous Kay Sundrum. Pat Brown's down there in Texas, not in a hurricane at all. And, not anymore. Uh, <laughs> I'm here in Central Florida doing the thing we do here in Central Florida, which you probably know of as Florida Man on the news. Anyhow, tonight we're going to be talking about, as always, whatever you want, but we're going to start talking about the tools pilots and student pilots use to be successful in their training or in their flights. Because, you know, learning to fly involves a lot more than just getting access to an airplane. You have to also have a bag full of tools, things you can take with you that make sure you get where you're going. Now, to be fair, I have to tell you, Pat and Kay and I are not making this run tonight. We're pretty, but we're not the smart ones. The smart ones are Kevin Cortez in the background, keeping all the wires and tubes lubed up and working. And we've upgraded ourselves to Donnie McKay, who's hidden in a secure underground location, not at the base of Mount Rushmore. Government cutbacks caused that one to be unavailable. But Donnie is secure in an underground bunker where he can make sure there are no glitches in this broadcast. And man, I hope that turns out to be true. Don't you guys? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. In any case... Um, ask any question you want there in the, uh, the notes. Hello, Martin. It's nice to see you too. Eric Pittman. I actually just talked to Eric Pittman the other day. We spoke on the phone. He, like I, is actively shopping for an airplane and you know how much fun that can be. So we've all been aircraft owners just right now. I'm the only one on your screen who's not an aircraft owner and I really feel bad about it. So. You have a lot of experience with it, so you're gonna you're you're you'll get there. Yeah, oh yeah. Fast. Well, and and in the last year, you've both bought an aircraft, haven't you? Or you you've both been involved with entities that have purchased aircraft many times. That's correct. Very awesome. Well, yeah. I think that's a goal for a lot of people, but to get from where you are to that point where you're buying an airplane, you kind of need to have some tools. And I'm, I'm going to throw something out there. Pat, I'm coming to you. Sure. I now use for a flight bag this. It's yes. actually a backpack. It, it's great. It fits everything I need. I can even throw some laundry in here. So if I'm traveling long distance, this is the only bag I need. But that's not what I started out with. Do you remember what you used as a flight bag early on? Early on, uh, no, well, first of all, early on is back before there was much of anything to have to carry with you in the airplane. So I'm talking about back when the Wright brothers were, were teenagers. Um, uh, so I honestly can't remember way back that far. But when I got active flying again in the uh, early 90s, I actually just went out and bought a gym bag. It literally had one of yep. those champ, champ or champion gym bags. It just started throwing stuff in there, and, and that, that, that worked. In fact, I carried that for years. I carried that thing. Now, Kay, I have a feeling that just being female and a Southern Californian, you may have a little more style. How about you? What, what did you use for a bag early on? Did, did you go with a high-end pilot flight bag, or did you, like, go down to the grocery store and get an extra paper sack? <laughs> In between. So I, I was a, I was in high school when I really did my, uh, fl you know, flight training. And I do remember what my flight bag was. And it was, uh, I had a, a, a Jepson kit, the student pilot kit. Mm -hmm. And it comes, and they still sell it today. It's 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 a little bit more fancy or a little nicer now. But um, I unfortunately, I don't have that bag with me anymore. But, uh, you know, it, it's just enough to put your basic items and we're going to be talking about that, you know, have your headset and, and have your uh, clipboard and things like that. And, uh, and it comes with your, the textbook that you need and things to prepare for your private pilot. So that's, that's what I use. I bought it as a kid and it saved, uh, well, I have to say it saved my parents because they were, they were the ones who bought it. Uh, it saved the money by buying it as a kid. Well, Eric Pittman is back. He says, my flight bag is a small Samsonite carry-on so I can carry all my gear and I can put in a set of clothes for an overnight. Eric is flying a PA-28-140, a Cherokee 140, where space is not 
expansive. But you know what? That kind of goes to the point we're making here. You don't have to spend hundreds of dollars on a flight bag. You can go with something very, very rudimentary. You know, as Pat said, a gym bag. I used to use a, uh, before I used the, the backpack, and this is my second backpack. I've been doing this for about 10, 15 years. Yeah. I used to have like this square bucket with a handle. I mean, it was a fabric <laughs> bucket and it had a section for the headset and it, it worked. It was great. My my current uh, my current one. I was joking about the Wright brothers. We have a viewer that says, "Like he said, you really flew with the Wright brothers." No. Uh, no, I'm just joking. But uh, my current one. You remember a few years ago, Brightline came out with a bag, and and uh, it was kind of a modular kind of a thing. You could add pieces. And mm -hmm. I don't know if they're still in business or not, but I thought that that was so so cool. I bought one of those Brightline bags, and um, and it carries a couple of headsets. It's got plenty of room for some of the other things we'll, we, which we can talk about later. But, but, but it's 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 really not not all that big. It's probably uh, I don't know, twelve or thirteen inches wide and probably about fourteen inches tall and and deep enough to carry a head a couple of headsets and a few other things. Um, it's it's uh, and with a nice carry handle and a shoulder strap if I wanted to use it. So it's it's perfect for what I do. But I like the module ones, and that's what I, I have now because yeah. it's great depending on what you're flying. Like if I'm flying by myself, I like to have my bag in the, you know, co-pilot seat and be able to access things. And, you know, I want my Gatorade and I want it right here. I don't want to have to reach in the back. And, I want it now. <laughs> and also I'm short and my seat is all the way up front and I really can't reach the back. So I kind of need everything up front and uh, or if it's supplemental oxygen and that kind of stuff. And so that's all in the bag. But when I'm instructing and I'm, I'm meeting a student in, at a 172, I don't need all that stuff with me. So I can just take those other pieces off yeah. and I will need a headset. Whereas in my own airplane, it's already it's, it's in there. So I don't have to carry that with me. So depending yeah. on where I'm, you know, who I'm flying with and what aircraft, then that modular uh, flight bag is really convenient. Yeah, it's nice when you can, there's some out that, that have, where you can uh, take off just the uh, the headset portion, you right. know, if you just, and, and that mic, you can't do that on a mic, but, but I, I like that feature too. You know, I'm going to make a point here, and, and Kay, you just alluded to it, it's organization. Now, you want a bag that you can carry everything in, but at some point, as you get a little better at it, a little more professional, it becomes a big part of your life. You want to have some type of organization. So in the front pocket of my bag, the smallest one, I keep pads and pens because that's what I have on my lap when I fly. The second pocket back is my headset. The third pocket back is the survival stuff. So my... my uh, personal locator beacon, my handheld radio, that sort of stuff. And all the way in the back is the iPad, because I don't think you're allowed to fly anymore without an iPad. That's a law, isn't it? I think so, yeah. <laughs> FAR 91.4816, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, subsection A. <laughs> Well, Jamie, you, you mentioned that you have your uh, emergency stuff in there. So for me, my emergency equipment is a separate bag by itself. So it depends oh, wow. on where you're flying, right? You're in Florida and I'm in Southern California where I have a whole bunch of mountains and deserts. And uh, and so, yeah, my survival equipment would not fit in my flight bag. I keep them completely separate, but I keep them in a place. They're in the back and it's not too far away that if, uh, that um, you know, God forbid you need to get it, you'll have, be able to uh, reach it, so. Well, normally I carry two knives. Um, I don't have a knife in there right now because when I flew out commercial to Texas to pick up Pat's plane, you can't go through security with a knife. So I had to take it out, and Pat and I went knife shopping in Texas. Yay! <laughs> then I flew up to Frederick to pick up an airplane at, at company headquarters, and again, I'm on the airline, so I had to take it out. But you know what I do carry, and, and this is off the beaten path, I carry water and snacks. In this case, uh Publix macadamia nuts. Yay. Um, seriously, because I live in a very, like both of you, I live in a very harsh environment, as, as most people really do if you get outside of civilization. It's typically in the 90s here with high humidity. And if I was to go down in, a, in an off airport landing, if I have to walk very far or through brush and things like that, I want real shoes on my feet, not flip flops. And I want water and snacks because it could be a long time before I get out of there. Do either of you carry things with you? It's not technically a tool, but it is a survival supply. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's a whole f full full list. In fact, I want to encourage our viewers to watch our Air Safety Institute's uh, seminar on it's called Surviving After the Crash. Yeah, and they tell you exactly what you need to have. That actually prompted me, that came out a few years ago, uh, it prompted me to pick up a personal locator beacon. And PLB. Um, for all these years, I didn't, I didn't have because I just thought, all right, there's an ELT, and there's even a switch up in the front here that I can activate if I need to, and and that was good enough for me with the cell phone. And but um, after watching that course, and I hope all the viewers will. Again, it's, it's ASI surviving after the crash. Uh, it's excellent, and they'll tell you everything that you need to have in preparation for any flight. Plus, uh, what to do um, should you find yourself, uh, you know, isolated and in, in, in not even just in hostile terrain, even regular situation where you just are waiting. There are things mm -hmm. to do and not do. So, hope you can watch well, you know, I, I was influenced by some fellow named Pat Brown who has an EL uh, emergency personal locator beacon. And really, seriously, I got one because Pat Brown carries one. And I've flown from Key West up to Boston. And you'd think, oh, it's the East Coast of the United States. It's very densely populated. There's a lot of nothing out there, farmland and forests. And I mean, the cities are in little pockets. So there is a lot of territory where you could go down. And, you know, part of the reason, in all honesty, I carry one bag is I've talked to people who have gone down in the water before. And they've told me, You're, whatever you take out of the airplane with you, whatever's in one hand, that's what comes with you. Everything else sinks. So I, I like having a single bag. Pat, do you take multiple bags or do you do you keep it kind of simple? No, I keep I keep it as simple as possible. You know, if I'm flying around locally here and by locally, I mean 30 miles south to get a hundred dollar hamburger or something like that. I carry my headset with me and, and I have my PLB, but mm -hmm. I carry my headset with me and, and, and leave it at that. Um, if you know, we flew to Michigan, my wife and I flew to Michigan uh back in july and i got back from michigan turned around and flew up to oshkosh so we're talking about two really two thousand mile round trips back to back over a two-week period of time and i carried my flight bag with me there with things like water and and mm -hmm. not so much snacks because again we were flying over you know fairly populated areas we're not flying over over uh, the everglades or, or the deserts of, of west texas um, but uh, certainly water and uh, a, a number of other things that uh, that are not that are not uh, food or water related. Again, well, I know we'll get into all that stuff later. What about headsets? Now, when I started flying, and I, and I didn't start, I didn't fly with the Wright brothers, but I might have flown with Glenn Curtis. And when I started flying, the method of communication was we shouted at each other. We didn't yes. wear headsets and we used the little hand microphone. It was awful. And consequently, at least in part, my ears have been ringing for over 30 years. I now fl fly with Bose A20s. I've, I've also used light speed automatic noise canceling headsets. I really like those. Kay, what's your preference now and what did you start with? I have the Bose also, like you, and I and I love it. And I, people always ask, well, what headset should I get? And my answer is, get the best headset that you can afford. Mm -hmm. So if if it is the Bose, great. If it's not, then look look at something that is that has a noise canceling, maybe not as expensive. And if that's too too much, then you know take it a notch down. Just find the the best headset within your budget and try it out you know if you can if you can come to shows like oshkosh or or any of the aop regional events that we're having we're about to have and then you can test some of those products out and all the manufacturers will let you um you know keep it for about 30 days and and just see if it works for you and that's my recommendation now when i started off this was in the mid 80s um i had uh, david clark and didn't have the noise canceling, I know. And I still have that headset and it still works. Oh, wow. <laughs> so now it's it's here at home, it's not at the airport. I mean, I don't keep it in the plane or anything like that, but I just, uh, I, I, I kept it as a souvenir. But that's that's what um, we used back then and it seemed very, very popular, those, you know, the green, David Clark. Yep. Uh, and those I are the only two that. brands I've used. Yeah, I had a set of those. I actually gave them away to a friend who flies open cockpit because noise reduction headsets actually aren't great in open cockpit airplanes. They can kick off a lot. Pat, what's your preference and where did you start and where are you now in the headset well, world? 
You know, kind of like you, Jamie, I started flying back in the day when there was no such thing as intercoms. And my instructor was a, my instructor, my first instructor was an ex Marine. And he had two methods of, of instructing. One was yelling and the second was yelling louder. So I think I so, met that guy. Yeah. But, but uh, so, so when I, when I had to quit flying and became the quintessential rusty pilot, like many of us have, uh, I didn't have a headset. When I got back into it, I was surprised to find they had these two little strange little holes in the, in the instrument panel that you could plug something into. And the instructor said, well, you, that's a headset, Jack. And well, what? So I went and I bought a, a Sigtronics headset and oh, yeah. uh, for, for what it was, it was, it was just fine. I don't want to denigrate any, any brand of uh, avionics out there or equipment out there for what it was. It was just fine. And I flew that for a long time. And then I thought, um, you know, I'd like something maybe a little bit higher in. So I bought a, a David Clark. Um, this was before noise, noise canceling. So it was ubiquitous. And, and I used that. In fact, when I was towing gliders, I would use, even though I had a, a Bose at the time and, and a couple of light speeds, I, I would use that uh, David Clark. I would put uh, earplugs and then the David Clarks on top of that because the tow plane was so loud. It just, the tow, the uh, automatic, the, the noise reduction was just useless. Yeah. So as you said, it gets too noisy and it, it really is useless. Um, kind of uh, gravitated a friend of mine that flew uh, CRJs or something, I guess, for the airlines, loaned me a, um, a Bose X or a Bose 10. I'm not sure which one it is. It's the, the early, the early version of the, the Bose. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh man, I've died and gone to heaven. So I bought a Bose and, uh, and I've got, I, so I, and basically I, my, the, my combination of headsets now is I've got three, three Bose A20s and a, um, and an, old, an AKG uh, that, uh, that lasted on the market here in the United States for about a minute and a half, but, but, and, and there's a reason why, um, and, uh, and a, uh, and a, and a light speed. I don't remember which one, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, and I lock them all for different reasons, but uh, my, my go-to headset's the A20. I used to fly with a guy who amazingly enough, he, he wore earplugs and David Clark's. And you know what? I can't say he's wrong because he, for most of that ambient noise, it, it really killed off a lot of it. And he would just turn up the headset enough that he could hear the intercom stuff. I can't say it was a bad idea, but I think the only reason I can hear it all anymore is I went to good quality headsets. Yeah. And as technology improved, I went more with them. Speaking of technology, we used to put a lot of thought into flashlights. And when the mag lights came along with the little red lens, we were in heaven. I'm not sure people think so much about headlights anymore. And as we are firing up today, you know, even our tech staff are pilots. Donnie McKay is a pilot, so is Kevin Cortez. And Kevin was telling us he went on a sunrise flight this morning and brought a headlamp, you know, the elastic around the head thing. Is it my imagination or have people started thinking that the iPhone is a, an acceptable flashlight for airplane use? What do you think, Kay? No, not all. It's way too bright. As soon as you use that, you're going to, if it's nighttime or early in the morning, you're going to lose your night vision. And so it's not a good idea to have anything really bright, and especially the ones on the phone, because um, plus you, you, you're not going to be able to angle it right. Uh, hold the hold the phone it's just awkward and so if yeah. you can get something that's either mounted on your head or you clip on i use the clip on and uh, sometimes i'll put it on the seat belt too mm -hmm. so uh that that works for me but uh, the ones that have a uh you know they it, it's it's like a long little um what do they call it the, the gooseneck you know that yep. you can oh, yeah. you can uh, aim it so that's really nice um mm -hmm. and have that in your flight bag that's close to you not all the way back there because yeah. again, if you suddenly need it, then that's not the time to go looking for it. So um, yeah, rifling through your bag while you're in IFR bouncing around is not a great idea. <laughs> well, how about yeah. the red part, Pat? I mean, we've oh, all yeah. flown 152s and they had that great light up there with the knob right underneath the column where you couldn't see it and you could brighten it or dim it, but it had, they always had red lenses. And I know it seems weird. I think when people see it on TV or a movie, they think we're doing it just to be cool. Yeah. But the reality is the red lens doesn't ruin your night vision where white yeah. light does. Do you have a solution for that that you use or do you have red light in the airplane? No, I, get, I well, I've got red light in the airplane, but uh, 
it's it it kind of bathes the instrument panel in kind of this this dull red or this this kind of uh, soft red color, which is fine. But but you know my eyes are are getting aging with the rest of me, and 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 I need a little bit more light. So that red flashlight uh, really does come in handy. The real trick though is if you are looking at a sectional chart, remember those. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and you put a red light on the sectional chart, all the magenta goes away. <laughs> yep. Oh, that was a shock the first time I ever went on a solo cross country at night and turned on the light and all the marks were gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful about that. I remember years ago, um, uh, this was for Christmas and I was going to buy, my wife wanted a, a set of uh, coffee mugs and her tastes were very simple. So I, I can do that. And I was going to go buy some that matched the kitchen, which at the time was, uh, you know, the high fashion kind of avocado color that everybody's mm -hmm. kitchen was back. This is how many years ago it was. So I go to the grocery store, or the, the, the store, Bed Bath & Beyond or something, and I buy this nice set of eight coffee mugs. And they're this beautiful shade of green. And I take them home and I wrap them or, and put them away. Uh, some weeks later, I get them out to wrap them. And I think, wait a minute, I bought green. These are blue. And then I stop to think. <laughs> that I had my sunglasses on when I bought them. <laughs> they look green. Oh, it, it's a tough thing. Hey, by the way, Eric Pittman is a flight student getting near his check ride. He makes a comment here. He has a red headlight and a handheld tactical red light, too. And, you know, having that redundancy is always a good thing. It, it doesn't yeah. matter what tool you're talking about. Redundancy yeah. is good. And let's talk a little about tools and flight students. So this is for you, Eric Pittman, and anybody else who is. We used to fly with an E6B, the whiz wheel, which, of course, there's the famous picture of Mr. Spock on the bridge of the USS Enterprise, you know, using the, uh, the E6B. A lot of people turn to this now because there are gadgets that, that'll do it. If you're a flight student and you're going to take your knowledge test, you can take the whiz wheel into your test. You cannot take your phone. Anything that's got a memory, they're going to take it from you. So get good with that E6B. And Pat, what is the magic of the E6B? And we've spoken of this before, but it looks so complex. It's this round slide rule. But what's the key that every flight student should know? All the instructions are written on it. <laughs> yeah, there's, there is no mystery at all. You don't have to memorize anything. You literally, step by step, you turn it over and you do the wind drift side and just follow the instructions. Have a pencil, not a pen. Don't mark with a pen. Yeah, you don't want to do that. You don't and and that. I think, have we all done that? I certainly did when I was a student. Oh, yeah. And you know, yes. you just can't, you can't rub it hard enough to get that pen mark off either. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not possible. But that E6B actually is an important tool, isn't it, Kay? I mean, that does give us the opportunity to do a lot of the calculations that not just they're going to ask us on the knowledge test, but especially early on in your flight training, where you don't want to be a slave to the GPS and somebody who just follows the magenta line, the ability to figure out time, speed, distance, fuel burn, wind drift, all that, it all comes into play with that one simple tool, doesn't it? Yep, absolutely. You know, and also when you're when you're using that tool and you're doing your flight planning, you're really learning about your flight itself right you're making those decisions of okay well wh which leg should i be on uh, what direction and what kind of terrain am i uh, trying to avoid and what airspace is around and so as you're playing with that tool you're you're doing your flight planning too so take the time and and and, and go through those steps and write it down and not just for for uh, student pilots but i encourage resty pilots to do that also even though they may not need to do that on a flight review you never want to lose the um, you know the ability of a, where does this information that my gps populates where does that come from you because you might lose that gps and then you have you know, to go back to the basics and it's all about pilotage and dead reckoning right yeah. you got to be able to look out the window and look at your map and say where you are and then do the that time distant uh, ca calculations to see okay well this is where i was 10 minutes ago so this is where i should be now that's a skill that should never be lost yeah, and I don't think remember. I'm the only flight instructor that does this, but if I'm on a flight review with somebody and we go out, we do the hood work and we do the maneuvers and everything, and I tell them to take me home and I see they're using the GPS too much, I can guarantee there's going to be a power failure on this flight. It, it's going to happen. And Pat, I 
think if I'm not losing my mind, there was just an exchange right here on Facebook, unless you're watching YouTube, then it was over on Facebook. But there was a, a flight student who was complaining about uh, planning out the cross country for their check ride and they didn't want to do all the checkpoints and everything. They just wanted to program the GPS because that was easier. And I believe you were the wise gentleman who popped up and said, uh, that ain't gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were a number of wise people that popped in and said that that was not going to work. But, but you know, if if you read the ACS, the Airman Certification Standards, the cross country portion and the diversion are both pilotage. These are not nearest enter enter or direct enter right. enter follow the yellow brick road. Uh, these are this is pilotage. So uh, understanding the calculate the wind drift calculations, the the magnetic variation, um, all of all of those things. Um, that's really really important from a practical standpoint. If not, it, it, even if you just think from the practical standpoint of passing the check ride, you know. And but you learn once you learn to use it, and you learn the the, the the principles behind it. It's not difficult at all. Most of the time, you're going to be using your E6B for time, distance, and, and gas consumption calculations. That's probably 90% or more of what you're going to use it for, with the remaining being uh, the wind drift or the wind correction. Uh -huh. So, you know, this business about being able to figure density, altitude, and all those other things that are on the wheel, which is great. But from a practical standpoint, you're not going to use that nearly as much as how long is it going to take me to get there? How much gas am I going to burn? And 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 on the other side, what's my wind correction angle? Very true. And, you know, another tool that's very common early in flight training, and maybe we don't use it so much later because we have electronic flight bags that we'll talk about that do it for you. The plotter. It, it <clears> looks <throat> like just a ruler, but being able to figure out What's the distance and am I in nautical miles or statute miles and what's my am I going north, south, east or west? What's the heading? Being able to get that information and become fluent at it, adept where you can just do it fairly quickly. That's a huge plus, because, again, if you go into your testing center to take your knowledge test, they'll let you take the plotter. They're not going to let you take that computer app. That, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. And, and I'll share a little tidbit, by the way, for people who are going to take the knowledge test, any knowledge test. They're going to give you a, uh, a packet of diagrams, maps, figures, variety of things. Don't use your plotter to measure distance on those. It's wrong. That's part of the test. You're supposed to put your plotter up against, and if you'll notice, every one of those charts has a legend on it, has a scale. And if you put your plotter against that scale, they don't match up. So you have to take a scrap piece of paper and a pencil and make your own scale. It, it's one of those things I frankly learned it after I had taken my written. <laughs> and uh, you're going to get all those questions wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It won't work yeah, out. You know, the other thing, too, about using the plotter regardless of whether you use the one that kind of looks like the protractor or the one yep. that has the, the spinning wheel on it, regardless of which one you actually use, it's always good to have an idea about what heading are you expecting to see when you put, in other words, if you're flying westbound uh, and you read the plotter and it says zero, nine or zero, well, there's, that doesn't pass the smell test. So yeah. it's always nice to have an idea. Well, you know, that kind of hmm, that kind of looks like it's about 300 degrees. And all right, well, I'll put the plow. OK, well, it's 307. That passes the smell test. But, you know, whatever the reciprocal of that is, you know, 120 or whatever that is, that doesn't pass the smell test. Well, and that's the same thing when you're using the whiz wheel. People forget that the, you've got to figure out where the decimal point is for yourself. Yeah. And if you're burning 10 gallons an hour and you've been flying for 45 minutes and people whiz that around, they go, uh, 70 gallons. No. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work. <laughs> it, it's 10 gallons an hour and you've been flying for less than an hour. <laughs> Can't be more than 10. Yeah. But that's a common, common error. Speaking of common errors, you're both flight instructors. You do flight reviews with people. A lot of people are under the impression, once I pass my private check ride, the Airman Certification Standard is never going to come into my life again. I can throw it away. I never have to read it. But we have to do flight reviews. And Kay, when we do a flight review, it's to the standard set out by the ACS, isn't it? So 
if right. you've been a pilot for 50 years, that airman certification standard still has value, doesn't it? Absolutely. You know, it's a great idea to to take a look at that before your flight review. And I, I recommend people to do their flight review, if their budget permits, to do it annually instead of every two years. Because to, think about it, two years is a, is a long time. And and if, if your budget permits that, then, you know, do that um, in half the time. And a lot of flight schools and flying clubs, if you want to go rent an airplane, they will require that you have your flight review every year. That's number one. But then when you take a look at the, uh, the ACS for the flight review and think about the items where you might be a little rusty. We all have certain areas that we're really good at and there are other areas that we need to spend a little bit more time on. It might be crosswind landing for one person. It, it might be just, um, you know, shooting approaches down to the minimum for somebody else who's not comfortable in IMC all the way down to the minimum. So everyone has their strengths and weaknesses and look at those areas where, hey, this is it's something that I want to spend time with my CFI and just, um, you know, up my game. And that's, that's where you really want to dive in and look at what the standards are, what some of the common errors are, and then and spend time on the ground before you go to your instructor and get that flight review. You could also I really like consider... this question, by the way. I don't mean to interrupt you, Pat. I really like this question. If budget permits, how much is a flight review? That is a great question because the regulation is minimum one hour ground, one hour flight. It depends on what you're flying. And do you own the plane? Are you renting the plane? Is it a single? Is it a twin? You actually have a lot of latitude in what that flight review is gonna cost you, but don't cheap out and go for the one hour, one hour. Try and really learn something because all, and I think all three of us, we try and challenge ourselves in flight reviews. And I was just going to ask you this question, Pat, and pardon me because I'm stepping on you. You had something else to say. The biggest, coolest piece of equipment in a flight review is the aircraft. And I've mm -hmm. done them in twins, singles, seaplanes, biplanes, open cockpit, enclosed, all kinds of stuff because we get to fly a lot of things. There is no way I can go flying a Cub on floats or a Stearman or a Technum Twin and have the same experience on a flight review. What's your stance on flying something different in a flight review? Oh, I think if you can, I think you, if you have the, the luxury of, of having something like that available to you um, and to kind of tag on to what Kay had said earlier about annual flight review, remember you've got the WINGS program too. And mm -hmm. if you if you participate in the wings program, you're actually getting a flight review as you finish a phase of wings. That's the equivalent of a flight review, and that can be an ongoing thing. It's it's like a or like a just a uh, uh, I guess an ongoing recurrency training really is what it is. Like a prog almost like a progressive annual where that, that some flight schools do. You're constantly uh, working over the course of the year. And when you're done with a phase, you've got a flight review out of the way. So you can do that with wings as well. And Pat, I'm glad you brought up the wings program because that lets you uh, tailor your flight review to what you want to do. You That's might right. want to be working on the seaplane rating. And so you can, uh, kind of have your flight review in in something that will help you towards that goal. Or um, maybe you're really rusty on the instrument flying. And so when you do the flight review, you're going to do it in an airplane that you normally you fly and in instrument conditions. And then uh, you could even couple it with an IPC instrument proficiency check. I mean, there's yeah. two separate items, but you you really can tailor that that flight review and IPC, if you use the WINGS program and it'll keep track of everything for you and, and give you lots of options for, for ground training that you do yeah. independently, so you're not getting charged for it. And yeah. um, it, it's a great litmus test. Like if you take one of those um, you know quizzes and you and say you fail it, say it's on uh, weight and balance and, and just uh, uh, performance calculations and you don't do well on it, what that means is that you need to spend more time on that, that's all. And so it's a yeah. great litmus test. Yeah, and AOPA has the, uh, uh, the, the I forget what we call them, I'm embarrassed to tell you, but we have uh, uh, flight review uh, guides. Maybe Kevin can pull, pull it up. I'm just I'm having Focus a flight review. Moment. Focus flight review. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. We have several of those, I think several scenarios, if I remember right, on the Focus. I believe there's about review. eight of them. 
Yeah. yeah. And so that's if you're not really sure what you need to do or want to do, because remember, the flight review is some is can really be whatever whatever we as, as pilots receiving the flight review want it to be, as long as it conforms with the basic requirements of one air, one area, one hour on the ground and one hour in the air. Martin just just chimed in. He got just got checked out in Saratoga. I'm, I'm very familiar with that Saratoga. I've, I've actually done a couple of check rides in it. And um, and he's saying that it's a great way to uh, get a complex endorsement and a flight review at the same time. So uh, there's a perfect uh, example of somebody that went out, sought out an airplane that he doesn't uh, does, had never flown before and turned it into a flight review as well as a checkout. And of course, you can bypass the flight review by getting a new certificate or rating. Sometimes you, you go up and get a glider add-on or you get a seaplane rating or something like that. That takes the place of the flight review. And just to be clear on this, uh, Kay's suggestion about doing a flight review annually, that's not hyperbole. Each of us does that. That's all, all AOPA pilots do annual flight reviews. It's never a bad idea to go fly with CFI and be evaluated and find out, gee, there's something new or there's something I haven't thought of before. And it can be a really interesting challenge. You know, I did one in a, in a J3 Cub on floats once, and we were headed back home. We had finished almost everything. And actually, I was doing a flight instructor refresher. Instead of doing the FERC, I went for the check ride. And on the way home, the examiner said, hey, let's do some eights on pylons on the way back. <laughs> And uh, I hadn't done an eight on pilot in a while, so it was interesting. What's hey, the pivotal got, altitude yeah. on that? What's I'm the pivotal sorry? altitude? I said, what's the pivotal altitude on, a, on that cub with floats? About fourteen feet. Yeah, it, it, seriously, it's it's between five and six hundred. You're, yeah. you're right down there, and it's yeah. uh, it's interesting. You don't want to be someplace with tall towers. No, 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 no. Are you? Were you going to go to Jennifer here? She has a really I was, interesting. I was. I was going to say Jennifer Johnson, and I love that name. I just do. She says, I almost feel as a newer low hours pilot, an hour flight with an instructor every six months or so might be prudent. I'm going to say, yeah, just to break bad habits that might be developing. I don't know that for sure. Just preparing for check ride. You know, I say this in all honesty, Jennifer, I don't think any of us would disagree with that. Flying with an instructor when you've got the opportunity, not only could you learn something, it might actually be fun and Getting a relationship with an instructor can be an invaluable thing. I'm going to out myself here. There was a time early in my career when I was relatively terrified of designated pilot examiners because of the power they had over me. I had no idea. It's just another pilot, and they like doing this as much as I do, and they have questions too, and they go on check rides too. I mean, Pat is a designated pilot examiner. CFIs and DPEs are nothing to be afraid of. Would, would you agree, Pat? Just go fly mm. with them for fun. We're teddy bears. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't fail a flight review anyway. So you can, even if right, you, you go are. there and you and you say you that's really right. don't do well, you had just had a bad day, that that's CFI right. doesn't write in there. You know, it doesn't give you a pink slip. There is, no. It's not a check ride. And so you can't fail. They'll have you, he or she will have you come back a second time, maybe even a third time. It all depends on how much rust there is and uh, to, to knock off. And, and that's it. It's, it's a learning experience. And a good CFI will tell you that right in the beginning. I mean, they want to make it enjoyable. You don't want somebody who just comes to you and say, all right, what do you want to do? That's disorganized. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. the opposite extreme. So they got to have a plan, and this is where that you know the wings program is great. If you take the you the, the pilot takes the initiative to go in there and say, hey, these are the areas that I want to do, want to really focus on, or better yet, pick one of those of uh, those modules in, in AOPA focus flight review. I did the one on. Uh, take off on landings. And, you know, I've been a certificate pilot for a few decades, but mm -hmm. I still did that one because I really, I just wanted to do a whole bunch of performance landings at this small little strip. And, and I was using uh, a, a Cirrus SR-20. So it was, yeah. it was challenging. If you can get that plane in that airport, I can get it anywhere around yeah. here. So that's the whole reason why I chose to do that one. And so um, I encourage you to, to take a look at the focus flight review and, and uh, remember your instructor is there to, to move you, help you move along. You cannot fail it. We had a, I think we had a, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead Pat. No, I was going to say, I, I saw a question come up about the flight, the wings program. Jamie, you want to take a whack at that? 
Yeah, I actually, I was going to read a couple of these. Cavalier 102.5. I'm assuming they work at a radio station, 102.5. <laughs> um, I've heard mentioned the Wings program, but I'm not sure how to access it. It's the FAA FAST team, which is FAA safety team. If you look that up online, you can find a connection to it. Uh, if you log in and create an account, just give them your email address. They'll start sending you what they call spans messages for safety meetings that are having happening in your area. Don't be afraid to talk to an FAA person when you go to one of those meetings. They're the nicest people in the world. They really do try to help you. Yeah, there's a big bureaucracy. It's not all their fault. Just those folks really are there to help you keep in line with what you want to do. And there are all sorts of specialized things for different types of flying. The, the WINGS program is guided by you and what type of flying you want to do. We also have Wander C. Santos Santos who says, I would like to have an AOPA cap, please. Um, I got to wonder, is Wander C. Santos Santos, are you a member of AOPA? Because, you know, I'm pretty sure if you were to join, they would send you a hat. Or I'm sure if you were to call up and say, I want to be a member, but I want one of those cool hats. I have a feeling your mailbox may have a gift for you in the very near future. And we've got Don Nelson. I love Don Nelson right off the bat because his first two words, geezer here. I can identify with this, Don. Not not K. K is too young and fabulous. Pat and I were well into the geezer territory. I never <laughs> flew with my instructor without learning something. I tried to go up every six months, use my plane for business. Spending time with instructor is not a cost. You make a good point. It's insurance because I, I don't think K. I don't think I've ever flown with anybody I didn't learn something from. And and I flew with Pat in a Cirrus in Texas. And first time in a Cirrus, I absolutely learned a lot about a new and very different aircraft, and I got a lunch out of it. So it was well worth it. <laughs> you, you agree? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you just can't fly with another pilot and not learn something, can you? No. You know, every time I come out to AOPA for so, for our all hands meetings, things like that, I I make it an a, a, an effort to fly with one of our staff pilots there. Every single time I've been out there because, and it's, it's usually a different airplane, go somewhere different. And I, I, I love that. And I do that out here too. A good pilot is, is always learning. You never get to the point where, okay, I have all these certificates or I'm a DPE, you know, uh, and, um, and I don't have to, to learn anything else anymore. You, you got to keep training. Yep. By the way, we've got a great one up here from Lance Kalil, FAAsafety.gov. Lance gives us the link to the WINGS program. And I got to say, Lance knows of what he speaks. He is the, the big dog at King Sky Aviation in Lakeland, Florida. It's, it's a really successful flight school. And he's a significantly better golfer than I am. We played in a cherry <laughs> tournament last year, and he was so nice not to laugh in my face. And Lance, thank you very much. And the rest of you, let's not speak of this again, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> but Lance does make the point that FAA is a great resource. They're not as scary as people think. If you get the chance to go to AirVenture or Sun and Fun or some of the bigger events, there is an FAA presence there. You can walk in and ask them questions. I actually talked to a guy just recently who went in and talked to somebody at the FAA at Sun and Fun in the FAA building, and he was waiting on a special issuance medical and had been waiting for quite some time. They processed it right there and gave him his medical at the show. Wow. So, I mean, they are a real resource. Don't be afraid of them. Go in and they're not doing facial ID and going to track you on your way home. So it's okay. Now, I want to bring up, a, a, we talked about E6Bs and plotters, but there's a tool that used to be in every pilot's flight bag that is rapidly disappearing. I want to talk about charts, specifically VFR charts, but also IFR charts, because they update much more frequently than they used to. And I got to tell you the truth. Dear viewer, I was a slave to the paper chart. I kept the VFR charts in my bag for years. And then this Pat Brown dude just shamed me into going all digital. And, and he pointed out that in my case, I've got a GPS in the panel. I've got an iPad in the cockpit. And I've got a phone with ForeFlight on it. So I've got double redundancy. I have now gone, like my buddy Pat, to an all digital interface. 
and I'm not unhappy at all. The, the updates are real easy. Kay, how about you? Are you all digital? Do you still carry some paper or are you all paper? No, I'm, I'm digital. I, I like uh, electronics and gadgets and I really think that improves our situational awareness. It reduces our workload. The, the, the digital items and you can focus on the on the safety and the efficiency the key is really knowing how to use your digital products well all right on the ground and then the second piece of it is having a backup because if you're going to go digital you have to have a backup and and preferably a backup to the backup and so mm -hmm. those are the two things uh, yes it reduces the workload it's wonderful for the situational awareness, but you got to know how to use it well and you have to have a backup. And so what I use is like yourself, um, I got an iPad and uh, I got it right here with me. So I like it with a little clipboard on the side and I use a mini. So the, the mini is what I'm using in the Cirrus, but then when I go into to the, uh, you know, the 172 or any of the training airplanes then I use my backup, which is a regular size iPad. And I have that on the on the yoke obviously in the Cirrus I don't have a yoke right <laughs> um, so that's why I, I use a kneeboard on that um, but I do carry the instrument approach plates for my home base and where I'm going if it's going to be IMC I like to have those um, and yeah you have to pay for that extra chart even though I'm paying for it on my panel mounted IFR equipment but that's a cost to, for me that, that that's worth having it. Now, I don't have the type of IMC that, that other parts of the country does, but I am coastal. And so when it's IMC, I mean, it is down to the minimums. And so I don't want to find myself, you know, having blank screens and in the event that there's an iPad issue because they do heat up. That's the only issue I seem to have with the iPad is, is mm -hmm. the temperature. And well, we being all live in the sun, sun belt. They can get it. The, they right. Can get us. Yep. Yep. And uh, and sometimes it's not even when it's in the direct uh, sunlight. I was in um, Phoenix the uh, maybe a few weeks ago, and it was not directly in the sun, and it was just so hot that it but shut it down. Was Phoenix. <laughs> It was Phoenix. It was Phoenix in, in August. Summer. I know, I know. Why? Why did? Oh, yeah. It was. It was hot. I was flying. It was. It was sunrise too. And so it's not that I didn't plan for that or yep. anything. But it was just hot enough that the iPad shut down. And that's the reason I do like to have the um, the backup for the for the iPhone. Well, sounds like you and Holly Bot are right in sync. Holly says she uses digital and keeps paper as a backup, but she also says she just ordered new charts today. And Holly, you need to talk to Eric Pittman because Eric says his check right is coming up and he went to the FBO to see if he could buy some charts and was laughed at. They said, who uses paper charts anymore? Eric, if you want to use paper charts, use paper charts, especially coming up on your check ride. Pat, you're a DPE, and I would love to hear your perspective. What's your thought about paper or digital on the check ride? I asked for the for both on an instrument check ride. Well, really, private instrument or commercial, whatever I'm doing, I do ask that they bring paper charts and plot their cross countries out on paper charts and use a paper flight log, because to be quite honest with you, it's just it's easier to spread a paper chart out on the table mm -hmm. and kind of get the big picture as to what's going on. It, mu it makes the oral much easier in my experience anyway, to be able to just kind of look around the paper chart and say, Oh, what, geez, what is that? You know, instead of having to, 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 you know, move around on the iPad, yeah. which has got a screen about that big. So, you know, I, I do ask that they do it for a check ride. I know other examiners that really don't care one way or the other. I just have found that that uh, that that is is easier. So that's that's my story. Yeah, I actually prefer. I feel more confident going into a check ride well prepared. I'd rather spend a couple extra bucks, have the books, have the charts, have the, the digital, whatever I need. So whatever the examiner wants to see, I've got it. And Pat, you and I did a. a kind of a Facebook, YouTube thing when I was out in Houston, flying back to, to Florida. And we talked about how you plan that route. And we were going over it on an iPad. If we could have just had a whole bunch of charts spread out, it would have been just cakewalk because there's a lot of complexity there. So Jennifer, now you know, you talk to a DPE. Yeah, you, you could maybe find an examiner that doesn't want paper, but 
me, I'd be taking paper and digital on that check ride. You know, for, for the trip that we made to Michigan and the, and the trip that we made to, uh, well, really to, to Sun and Fun, the trip we made to Oshkosh, uh, I planned it all out on a, an iPad. Um, and, and what I did was basically put in my, 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 dest- my beginning airport, my, my, my point of origin, and the destination, let's just say Fond du Lac is where we flew into. And mm-hmm. then I thought, how many fuel stops do are, we, are we going to need under normal circumstances? And the airplane we flew, the answer was one. And we wanted to make the first leg slightly longer, so the second leg was slightly shorter, just, make, you know, it's psychological. Mm-hmm. So I just, you know, I looked, I'm looking at the magenta line, which is about that long. And I said, okay, about two thirds of the way is there. And so I put a waypoint in there and then, and then expand, expanded it and said, okay, now where is there an airport close by this waypoint? And uh, happened to be, uh, it happened to be uh, one that I knew had a restaurant on the field. And so it took, we had to jog a little bit. Big to get win. There. So it wasn't, there's a restaurant. It, well, that's a big win. I'm telling you, that's a huge win. So, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you can you can certainly plan across country quite safely and quite uh, efficiently on an iPad. But um, it, but it, the iPad is, in my view, is 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 good for kind of the big picture of you, when you're looking at a really, really long cross country, a thousand mile cross country, it's nice to have the iPad because it's all just right there. Then you mm-hmm. can kind of dissect it as you, you know, put your waypoints in there. I'm going to stop here for gas. Okay. Now let me expand it and let me see, well, where does that put me? What well, puts me in the middle of nowhere? That's not going to work. Mm-hmm. So what's the closest class Delta airport? When I fly across countries like that, Typically, I want to go into a Class Delta or a Class Charlie airport because I can be pretty sure there are services on the field that can handle something that might go wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you look at AirNav or some of these places that talk about uh, airports that have services on the field, and maybe it's a maybe it's just a Class Echo airport somewhere, a Class G airport, you know, inside a magenta shape or something. Uh, and they say services available. You may not really know what to, to what extent those services are available, and are they available seven days a week? Yeah. So typically I found that if I go into a, and it's not, not entirely true, but, but most of the time I find that if I go into a Delta or a, particularly a Charlie airport, uh, there's more likely to be some help if, if I really find myself stuck. Yeah, that, that's all good stuff. Let me change gears a little bit here because I live in the center of Florida, right in the middle of the panhandle. And if I take off and head south, I'm about 15 minutes from nothing. Miles and miles of absolutely nothing. Pat, you're in East Texas. If you take off and head west, you've maybe got, what, a half an hour before you're just wide open spaces. Kay, you've got a different deal. You've got maybe the most congested airspace in the world right there in Southern California. How do you keep track of traffic besides just looking out the windshield? Well, well, that is the, the, the most important way, right? You look outside. But uh, to supplement that, I like to have the, the, the ADSB traffic and also an, an a, you know, on my iPad, I like to see, get the traffic on there. You know, you need to have the equipment for it. Uh, you need to have that ADSB in receiver but that helps so much and and i'm going to kind of look at it from a different angle from what pat described his his uh you know long trip that he likes to use the ipad for that um i'm going to look at the other spectrum and say i like to look at it in in the short space where it's really busy because you can zoom in and zoom in and keep zooming in which you can't do in a chart but in my neck of the woods here in, in san diego and in los angeles um the chart is not big enough, even the TAC chart, the terminal area chart, it is not mm-hmm. zoomed in enough. And so that is one benefit of having the, uh, the digital sources. And then when you put traffic on that, it really, really helps you from a safety perspective. You can zoom in so much that you can see within the traffic pattern. I'm based at Palomar Airport, just north of San Diego. And sometimes we are out on downwind where when we turn base and final, we're on a three mile final. This mm-hmm. is a traffic pattern. All right, we're number eight for landing. And so uh, it can get extremely busy. And so when you can see that on the screen and um, if you have it Bluetooth enabled, you can also get the audio warning, then that's really helpful. 
Let me ask you a question now. You mentioned ADSB, and that's a requirement in certain airspace now. Any place that used to require mode S, ADSB out. But out. how do you get the in? How do, how do you get the information that shows you where all this traffic is as opposed to ATC seeing where all of it is? Right. So if you want to have that in, you can have that uh, in your panel mounted system or you can have an external receiver, an ADSB receiver, and then that will give you free traffic and weather. So using TISB and FISB, and I don't want to get into all the, uh, the, the alphabet soup there, but it's basically free weather and free traffic if you opt to get that ADSB in receiver. Very cool. Yes. By the way, I got to point out, Mark Bruno has just said, good evening, ambassadors. Mark Bruno, rusty pilot. Mark Bruno was one of the 10,000 pilots that was rusty, went to an AOPA rusty pilot seminar, got current. He's flying routinely now. I bump into him out and about now and then. One of the nicest guys in the world. But you know what? That rusty pilot thing works. And, and by the way, for those of you who are interested, Pat and I are doing one tomorrow, a webinar at three o'clock Eastern time, two o'clock central. Yeah. So uh, there's probably t still time to, to sign up for that. So go check out AOPA Rusty Pilot and see if you can get logged into that. And uh, if you miss that one, then join me on the 29th at you 9 a.m. Pacific. Oh, wow. So we kind of got the whole world covered, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Jamie, I think it's... Pilots. Jamie, I think it's I think it's Thursday. You and I are doing one. I just looked at my cast. Wait, wait, what? What tomorrow? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I might be having one of those mini strokes, but okay, I'll go with Thursday. <laughs> that works. Well, hey, oh, we've just funny. got a couple minutes left on this. Uh, let's touch real fast on the electronic flight bag. We, we've talked about the iPad, and that's kind of what we're talking about, the electronic flight bag, where we have these devices, whether it's an iPad or an iPhone, or for reasons I don't fully understand, my buddy Pat there is an Android user. Is that true, Pat? Proudly so. Proudly so. So it doesn't matter what device you use. There's a tool out there that can really solve a lot of your problems. Now, the apps are free. A subscription is not. But it really does provide an enormous amount of information. And Kay, uh, well, actually, all three of us, we have redundancy because we've got at least two devices in the airplane, which yeah. means we're probably not losing situational awareness during that flight. I mean, even if one overheats, we start the other one up and we're good. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, Jamie, I, I you know I, I do love my Android phone, but I, I when when I fly, I carry two iPads. I carry an external battery, a large, high capacity external battery, a couple of mm -hmm. charging cables. I make sure that one of those iPads is down in a cool section of the airplane so that in case on the rare occasions that the other one overheats um, and and I have an external I have an external power source in the airplane that actually a panel mounted power power source in the airplane to plug the cable into. So yeah, I'm about as redundant as I know how to be. And I've also got a, a four flight type of an app on the Android. So I, I really have something here too, if I really need it for situational awareness. So um, I'm not opposed to iPads or iPhones. It's just, you know, it's one of those primacy things. So I've, oh, I got on this first. So well, now, whichever one you do that. use, I'm sorry. so whichever one you do use, just make sure that you're uh, to the viewers that you're really comfortable using it on the ground. Because keep in mind, if you're so used to having that app on an iPad and suddenly you're switching to an iPad mini, things will look different. And then if yep. you switch to a phone, you may not even be able to find most of the buttons because 75% of them are gone. So you have to do multiple clicks. And so make sure you're comfortable switching. If you're yeah. using and it as backup. Those, yeah, iPads use the metal back as a heat sink. So if you've got it in a case of some sort or a bracket that covers that up completely and it's not getting any airflow, you're much more likely to overheat. If you can lessen that coverage and get airflow onto it, the likelihood of it overheating goes way down. Yeah. Folks, we've done a full hour. I'm really pleased. This has worked well. And remember, I said Donnie and his magical powers will keep this going glitchless throughout. I think that worked. Kay, you got any parting words for our fabulous Mark Bruno, Holly Bott, Jennifer Johnson, Eric Pittman? I mean, they're they're hanging on the edge of their seats. What do you have to tell them as we part ways this evening? 
just keep learning. You're always learning, right? A good pilot is always learning. Thank you for being here and um, keep on learning. Pat, you got anything, you know, a barbecue recipe or something you can share? You are in Texas. I have I have one word, uh, strategery. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's, a, that's an obscure cultural reference. I'm sorry. It's a good one, though. Uh, uh, no, Leatherman. Get yourself a Leatherman and put it in your in your flight bag. You never know when you might need a little pair of scissors, a little knife, a screwdriver, a pair of pliers. And a Leatherman is an awfully cool little piece of equipment. It won't fix everything, but it can carry extra batteries. If No matter what you carry, if you have a battery-operated device, make sure you've got plenty of AA and AAA batteries and external charging devices for your iPad and and and, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and Martin just chimed in one word, Lockhart, <laughs> Texas. Yes, for barbecue. Lockhart, cruises, cruises, and blacks. Two great places that. for barbecue in Lockhart, Texas. I so, absolutely uh, love that. Well, hey, before we go, um, if you have an additional question, if something occurs to you down the road, you can say, man, I wish Pat or Kay could answer this because I know they're the real brain power here. <laughs> Write to us at ambassadors at AOPA.org. That's ambassadors with an S aopa.org and we really will answer you we love this stuff we really enjoy spending time with each other um we'll be back with you on september 28th another tuesday night second and fourth tuesday of each month so tune right back in here to facebook live or youtube live on aopa's channels and even twitter Come back and see us on the 28th and we'll have a whole new topic and we'll talk about whatever you want and maybe Maybe we'll have some barbecue from Lockhart, Texas. Folks, thanks a lot. I do appreciate Pat K. You were great. See you all next time. Be good. Bye-bye. Have a good, good evening. Night.